Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains, sadly, not reaching its full potential. And today, we are going to discuss five locomotives that had every reason, logically, to succeed completely. Like, they really should have worked really well on paper. And yet, when it came time to actually build them and put them into service, they just kind of flopped around and didn't really do much of anything exciting. These are five trains that should have succeeded and still failed. The British Rail Class 221, Super Voyager. No, no, this is after you went to funk. Get out of here. Uh, 3801, quick, still chair time. Thank you. Okay, so the Class 221 Super Voyager is a diesel electric train set that was built by. Oh, here we go. Bombardier? Bombardier. Is that how you say it? I think that's right this time. Bombardier. I just can't stop myself from wanting to say Bombardier. I'll never get used to it. Can I just call them Bombardier? Because they generally appear on my worst trains ever list. I still don't know how this company still hasn't gone defunct because they've made a lot of really questionable trains. They are like the grand masters of teething problems. But to be honest, the 221s are probably one of their better products. They're not perfect, pretty averagey, but their teething issues weren't super terrible. The biggest problem they ever really had was that units were stopping, just stopping dead, due to waves breaking over the seawall at Dolish in stormy conditions. It would inundate their resistor banks and cause the control software to shut down the whole train. This was later remedied with a software update, and they've been fine ever since. I did actually talk about these before, as during an overhaul, they were, well, handled poorly, and it caused exhaust fires. But that really wasn't their fault, that was a mistake doing the overhaul. The reason why I put them on this list is that, in many ways, they should have revolutionized British rail lines, because they're a tilt train. Oh yeah, they have a max speed of 125 miles per hour, and they were meant to place the inner city 125 and the class 158. In that way, you can look at them as kind of a successor to the APT, which never really had a chance to be good due to the expense of R&D, and a lot of government mismanagement. Now, the Super Voyager is still on the rails at this time, but they've never really hit the potential that one would expect from them. For one thing, it's Bombardier, and they're... themselves. The teething issues involving the units were there and were an issue, but it seems to come down more to two factors. For one thing, they're not actually the fastest trains on the lines, which seems to be the opposite of what a tilt train should be for. In fact, the tilt function doesn't even work for the 221s that are being operated by Cross Country. They inherited the units from Virgin Cross Country, and their routes are not cleared for tilting operation, with the sole exception of Wolverhampton to Stockport. So in 2008, the tilt mechanics of their 221s were locked out and then isolated altogether. They were replaced with hydraulic rams with fixed tie bars. The change did improve the reliability of the trains and reduce maintenance cost, but I thought the whole point of these was the tilt thing so they could go faster on older lines. Like, that just defeats the whole purpose of them. Also, they're hideously uncomfortable, apparently. No one really likes riding on them. The seats are small, close together, and there's not really a lot of room on the units for cargo. People have trouble storing their bags, and there's pretty much no space for bikes. And part of the reason for this lack of space is that the units were designed for the tilt function, so the carriages have a tapered profile that narrows towards the roof. This gives them a less spacious interior overall compared to the other carriages they replaced. And now, at least for one company, they aren't even tilting! So there's no point for them to be narrow like this. It's ridiculous! The Super Voyagers definitely aren't terrible, especially by Bombardier standards, but they definitely have not, and probably won't, ever live up to the potential that they should have been able to. The M-10001. That's an 
interesting looking train. Hmm, that locomotive streamlining is definitely old school, without question. It looks like someone's vision of the future, without actually being able to know what the future would look like. We don't make things like this anymore. It was constructed in 1934 by Pullman Standard, and it used a power system that was developed by General Motors Electric Motive Corporation. It was a successor to the M10,000, and the train set was actually articulated, including all the cars. Built to be exciting, and it was heralded as the new, awesome diesel technology of the future. It was also nicknamed the Banana, because people thought it kind of looked like a banana. Which does kind of defeat the whole mystique and excitement of the unit to a certain extent. Now, for 1934 standards, at first, this unit was very fast. It was known as the Canary Bolt. It set a record for 57 hours from coast to coast of the United States. It left LA at 10 p.m. on the 22nd of October and arrived at Grand Central Terminal in New York City on 9.55 a.m. on the 25th. This was an impressive feat for that time, but it didn't really last very long. For one thing, its original engine actually was found to be overtaxed, significantly reducing its lifespan overall. It was rebuilt to accommodate a larger 1200 horsepower engine, but it still didn't remain in service for any length of time, and the reason is that diesel technology was advancing at a very, very, very rapid pace. Though it was built and introduced in 1934, it was replaced by the M10,002 in 1938, and even it only lasted until 1941, when it was replaced by an EMC E3 locomotive set. Yep, the E-Series came into being. Despite the original M10,000 units actually being kind of good for their day, technology outpaced them so quickly that they never really had a time to shine very much. And even though they technically performed pretty well, it's hard to call them successful when they only existed for about 10 years, tops, before they were all scrapped. Also, to amend any confusion, the 10,000, the 10,001, and the 10,002 are the other ones that look like this. 10,003 up to 10,006 were remodeled quite a bit, and they're considered a bit different from the other 10,000s, and even they only lasted until 1953 before they were again replaced by the E-Series. The point is that despite being exciting and interesting, definitely distinctive looking, it just couldn't compete with those E-Units. Not many things could. The Fairbanks Morse Erie built. This may look like an E or an F unit, and at face value, yes, but you can tell from the cab that it's at least a little bit different, although modeled in that particular style. Constructed by Fairbanks Morse specifically to compete with units that look like this, like the Alco PA, the FA, or the EMD FTs, the Erie builds at face value should have been just as good as all of them, and 82 cab units were sold as well as 29 boosters. So why don't these get talked about very much? And why are they looked at as kind of a failure? After all, they built them from December of 1945 to April of 1949. Well, it was due to the engine. The engine they chose was a 2,000 horsepower, 10-cylinder version of their own Model 38D 8-18th opposed piston diesel engine. This particular diesel engine was successful as a submarine power plant during World War II. Now. Engines can be temperamental things. They don't always work well in completely different applications. The vibrations, the stopping and starting, everything's different when you compare a locomotive to a submarine. They just don't work in the same way. But none of that was actually this particular engine's problem. The issue was overheating. When they were used in submarines, they were given access to cool sea level air. But when adapted for use on land, especially for Western railroads like Union Pacific, the engines were operating under load at high altitude, high temperature, and low humidity, often also having to deal with the waste heat from leading locomotives. The Erie Belts also had a closed loop cooling system, while the submarines drew cooling water from the sea. And the engine actually had no head on it. Its exhaust ports were uncovered by the lower pistons. This meant the temperature for the lower piston was excessive, and under high load, it caused failure which could then cause cylinder liner damage, and a possible crankcase explosion, which sounds really bad, by the way. Fairbanks Morse did attempt to address the issue, but it was nearly a decade before they managed to create a piston that could stand up to locomotive operation. As a result, the Erie builds were not considered very reliable or very successful at all. Railways that used them in cooler climates 
did get away with a lot more. They were a bit more helpful there, but for the most part they wound up completely eclipsed by EMD. Not a single one was held for preservation, by the way. The Fairbanks Morse H-24-66 Train Master. Hey look, it's Fairbanks Morse again, and boy howdy, what an awesome name. In fact, what an awesome looking locomotive. That is the beefiest, bulgiest, most ultimate unit class locomotive I have ever seen in my life. And it's a high hood unit. I love those. They were six asshole road switchers, and they were deployed in the United States and Canada during the 1950s. 127 were produced, and upon their introduction in 1953, the 2400 horsepower Trainmaster was the most powerful single-engine diesel locomotive available at that time. Its pulling power and rapid acceleration could not be beaten, and it was touted by Fairbanks Morse as the most useful locomotive ever built. Which would alarm me as a consumer because it's kind of like saying the Titanic was unsinkable, you know? It's just one of those things I wouldn't have the nerve to say about a product. That's where I'm at with it. Also, you called it the Train Master. Like, you couldn't ask for more arrogance involved with this design. Now, I like them. They look really cool. But, uh, I feel like you were asking for trouble on this. And, sure enough, the Train Master was not considered very successful. The 2,400 horsepower is a good thing, on paper, but a lot of the railways felt that it was just too much for their purposes. They didn't need that much power in a single unit, there was no point in that, at least back then. They also had an inadequate electrical system, and a higher than normal consumption of cooling water. Fairbanks Morse also loved opposed piston engines, and there were difficulties involved with maintaining those that railways just didn't even want to get into. So naturally, they didn't have many buyers. Like I said, they only made 127 of them. Definitely not reaching the potential that Fairbanks Morse advertised them as having. Only one survived intact, which is the former Canadian Pacific Railway H-24-66 number 8905. It's now owned by the Canadian Railroad Historical Association, and they operate the Canadian Railway Museum in St. Constant, Quebec. Steam tenders. Look at this interesting development. Steam tenders were an idea that was actually attempted more than one time, and it involved basically putting a set of driving wheels on a locomotive's tender. And on paper, that's actually a great idea. Tenders, on their own, as far as the engine's concerned, generally just mean one extra car. Like, they're just another thing that has to be pulled. But if you make it so that they, too, have driving wheels, not only are you eliminating the need to pull the tender, which are also giving the locomotive overall much more attractive effort. And despite repeated attempts at the concept, it never ever took off. Why not? Well, the most information I've been able to gather about this involves one in particular, known as Sturrock Steam Tender that was developed in 1864 by Archibald Sturrock. He was the superintendent of the Great Northern Railway from 1850 to 1866. He designed the steam tender specifically to increase the power of freight locomotives, and he felt it would be very useful for starting the trains or on heavy gradients. Now, the cylinders in the tender were actually fed from the steam dome via a second regulator. There wasn't any compounding. It used a 23-foot-long copper pipe to do this. The exhaust steam from the tender was supposed to be condensed in 15 pipes at the bottom of the water tank, but when the water heated up, this wasn't very effective. It caused clouds of steam coming from the rear chimneys on the tender itself to spill out everywhere, and this made it so the crew just couldn't see anything. And the biggest reason why this design, as well as a lot of other attempts at this, weren't a success was the crew, like I just said. And it wasn't just that they couldn't see. The crews really, really, really hated these things so much because they wound up having to do twice as much work. The firemen had to do twice as much shoveling, and the driver had to take care of two regulators and two separate sets of valve gear. And no, they were not given extra pay for working on these locomotives. They were paid the same for twice as much work. And they weren't exactly a joy to ride on either. Apparently the footplates on these things became insufferably hot, because since steam was going in both sides, there was no cool spot for the crew to work on. They were stuck in between two furnaces, constantly, all day. And again, no extra pay! 
And wouldn't you appreciate that from your supervisor to come to you one day and say, hey, we're not giving you a raise, but we're going to ask you to do twice as much work. Like, nobody wants to hear that, ever. And what's even better is that despite logically being able to pull longer, heavier trains, there was a notable absence of things called air brakes on cars. The railroad didn't have cars like that back then. So even though the train could start, if it was too long and heavy, it couldn't stop. So there was no point to this extra power at all, at least not in those days. They remained in use only about four years, and these in particular wound up being scrapped sometime after that. No other steam tenders wound up working for rather similar reasons, if I'm being brutally honest. And with that, a special thank you goes out to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Brightline Blue, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsun 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, and Locke Kraken. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.